Let's turn to our Bible. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 49. Read from verse 13 down to 16. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains. For the Lord had comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord had forsaken me, and my Lord had forgotten me. Can a woman forget her suckling child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Read again in John chapter 8. Take from verse 1 to 7. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the Pharisees and scribes brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they say, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stood, stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the elders, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those that then accuse us, had no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Our title this evening will be, it's a strange title, but I'm sorry, you may be seated. I, I tagged it, Mama's Baby. Now, our scene today is going to open in the temple of Jerusalem. And for the young one's sake, Jerusalem means the city of peace. Jesus Christ is at Jerusalem teaching the gospel, the good news to the people. But while he's doing that, he's been interrupted by the scribes and Pharisees. They have brought a woman that has been caught in the very act of adultery. And according to the scriptures, she must be stoned to death. Now, unfortunately for us, most of us have the same idea about God like the Pharisees. We envision him to be a very ra a raging personality, someone who is always angry, someone who takes pleasure in punishing his children. This kind of high father who has so much high standards that he is happy to punish people who offend him. But this is definitely not our own God. For if we have this kind of vision about our God, it makes us begin to live in a legalistic manner, begin to live with God as if we are in a contract, not as if it's a, it's a relationship of father to child. And, in, and it has put in many of our minds that it is by our works that we are saved. But that's far from the Bible. For in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now you see it. Nothing you had, you did nothing to be saved. In fact, somebody that is good or somebody that is righteous doesn't need to be saved. It is those that are sinners that need the salvation of God. And so there was nothing we could ever do to merit the grace of God. It came directly from God when we were nothing but sinners. 
And now the subtitle for today is grace. If, I know if I'm talking about grace, like in the Pentecostal faith out there, grace has been changed to disgrace. There are a lot of people preaching grace to become disgrace. I find two problems with that. It's either they lack the understanding of the meaning of the word grace. And so while I was on this topic, I decided to check, let me check what grace really means from the dictionary. And I decided to choose uh, Merriam-Webster's dictionary just because the prophet used Merriam-Webster. It's not because it's a special dictionary. And this is what the dictionary defines grace as. Merriam-Webster defines grace as an unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification. I found this to be striking because the way others define grace is a permission to do anything. But no, it is an assistance from God for a purpose. It is for regeneration or sanctification. It is not just, okay, do whatever you want to do. Grace comes for a purpose. It's not a permission to sin. It's not one safe, I am safe forever. I can go ahead and do anything. No, God knew that man could not live righteously. So how could he do it? He offered grace, divine assistance to help man to be sanctified, to help man to be regenerated. It is grace that offers mercy. It is grace that brings forgiveness of sin. It is God's grace. Now, some of us may, may be thinking in our hearts that there is a kind of sin that we have committed that God would not answer us. God would just forsake us forever. We think that the depth of our sin, the height of the sin that we've committed is so terrible that God will not forgive. But this again is not the nature of our God. For Psalms chapter 103, please if you can help me with that verse. Psalms chapter 103 verse 8 is going to be a long reading to 17. This is the nature of God. Watch. Psalm 103, 8 to 17. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Amen. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far had he removed our transgressions from us. Like as the father pitied his children, so the Lord pitied them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembered that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. Now, this is the nature of our God. This is our God. He's not a raging, wicked man, as people picture him to be in our days. It is because of this kind of picture. It makes people go to a position where they self-justify themselves. I'm going to come to that. I hope time permits me anyway. But now, Abraham said you will know somebody by their reaction. He said that you can paint your action in a certain way. But it is your reaction when somebody does something to you. How do you react? That is when we know who you are. And then, the grace is as old as when sin began. The very first time man sinned, the reaction of God was grace. And then this this tells us that this is truly the nature of our God. Adam had, had seen the whole human race was in trouble. Adam did exactly what God told him not to do. And when Adam did this, watch God. Adam went hiding with fig leaf religion. But God had to come. Adam crying in the field. Adam, Adam, where is my son? Where is he? He was desperate looking for his own son. Adam, where are you? And finally, God found Adam. And what did God do? God looked to them. He had to, the, 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 the law was broken and the penalty for the broken law was death. What could God do at this instance? God looked. He took out their covering. He, 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 he killed the lamb 
and wrap them, looking at them, saying, don't worry, son. One day, a higher land will die for your sins, and you will not have to die for it anymore. This was God's grace shown to man. Now watch. Many of us, when we fall into problem, let's learn a lesson from Adam and God. When we fall into problem, some refuse to come to church. Some come to church and place a wall before them that whatsoever chastisement the preacher is bringing bounces off. If only they would know that after chastisement comes grace. God is not chastising you because he hates you. The preacher standing on the pulpit is not saying those words because he hates you. After those words, when you accept the chastisement that you are wrong, God offers grace. This always follows every time God comes on the scene. Now, that is how grace is as old. And now, grace left from there to show that I am just bringing Adam and Eve to show that this is the nature of our God. But what somebody reacts at the first instance, that is who he is. And now, God continued that grace with Abraham. I would have told the story, but I'd like to read it directly from what the prophet said. In a message, 610827, message of grace, paragraph 85. We call another character where God's grace was extended. Many of them will just speak of a few. Abraham, no special man. Come down from the Tower of Babel, perhaps come out of an idolater bunch. His father, come down in the land of Shinar, down there to dwell in the city of all. And while he was there, God spoke to him by grace. Not because he was different, not because he was be a better man, but by grace, God called him. The Bible clearly makes that known. Oh, Abraham, how Abraham tested God's patience. Told him, said, Abraham, stay in this land. Don't you go out. But as soon as farming come, Abraham ran. Abraham spoke of us. God took Abraham by grace and saved him. And that's how he takes you by grace. And how do we test his patience? Today we are up, tomorrow we are down. One day we believe, the next day we are wandering. Today we are Methodists, tomorrow we are Baptists. Today we believe in divine healing, tomorrow the tummy ache comes, and we don't know whether we believe it or not. But yet, in the midst of all that, God wants us to stay put. But he saves us anyhow. If it wasn't the grace of God, we'd all be gone. Sure, God saves us by his grace. Abraham was supposed to stay in that land, but he went down into the Chaldeans. Or not Chaldeans, but the Philistines. Went down there to sojourn to get out of the famine. Things was a little hard up in his country. So he went down there to join it down there with them. Done exactly what God told him not to do. But yet the grace of God appeared to him. Kept Pharaoh the king from taking his wife, grace of God. When Abraham said, it's my sister, lied about it, but yet the grace of God held him because he repented. He was willing to repent. And anybody that's willing to repent, the grace of God still goes for you. The grace of God is searching for you. So that goes for you, backsliders, this morning. I say this evening, the grace of God is still looking for you. If you just repent, God's grace is sufficient. How we took good old Abraham, brought him back. I remember Abraham was not saved by his works. He was saved by grace. He was saved by faith, which is grace. And God saved Abraham because of his grace, not because of his behavior. He saved him because of his grace. Oh, how good he was saved by grace. Now, that's the nature of our God. Long-suffering, patient with us, always looking for us to come back right. When we sin, the first thing in our mind is to run away from God's chastisement. But God is always searching, looking, crying out. Where are you? Come forth. He cries out in every minister, in every conversation. But yet sometimes we become so adamant that God is trying to speak to us. And yet because of this vision in our mind that, oh, we can't go back home. My dad will kill me. We run away from God everywhere. We know that even in our natural thing, when the father chastises the son, he is not going to kill him. If the son stays home two days and he doesn't come back home, you know how the father begins to feel. That's the same thing we do to God. We break his heart truthfully because the elect, all of them must come to God's kingdom. And one going out, it breaks God's heart. It takes God to tears. It makes him begin to fight. And the Bible says, if God did this actually for Abraham, the Bible says we are Abraham's seeds. Why wouldn't God do the same thing for you? 
if he did it for Abraham, why not you? If you are not still convinced, I will still go further. I will read in that same quote. 120, we'll start from 124 to 130. Now, this is talking about David. We know how David took someone's wife. And the Bible says David is, is referred to the apple of God's eye. David, a man of God, went astray, took someone's wife. And not just only that, he killed the husband. And here the prophet Nathan came to David and told David, look, there, there is a, a rich man down here. He had this, he had uh, so many flocks. And this other poor man had just one lamb, which he treated like a daughter. And then when the visitor came to visit the rich man, the rich man now went and took this other man's lamb and slayed it and used it for the celebration. What do you think we should do to this man? Human beings, immediately with the stone, he jumped. He must pay with his life. <laughs> Let me read it from the prophet. 124. Now, that was David's passions. He had 500 wives, but when he seen Uriah's wife, instead of taking one of his wife, one of his 500 wives to appease or satisfy his passion, you went and took this other man's wife, then killed Uriah when she became a mother. David didn't know what he was doing. Why? David was ready to pronounce judgment. That's the way we are. We can always judge the other fellow. But when it comes to us, oh, that's different. David said, the man will pay with his life. The old prophet, the eyes narrowed down. He said, David, surely you will not die. What grace there goes to work right quick. The spirit struck the prophet, saved David's life. Grace, surely you will not die. But the soul will not leave your house till you thoroughly purge your heart. For you are that rich man. Oh, it was different then, wasn't it? What saved David when his own judgment said, the man will die. He will pay to the uttermost, and he will pay for it with his life. And the prophet said, surely, grace in bracket, you will not die. You will not die. David, grace has saved you. It was grace to David that saved him. Oh, my. If it hadn't been for grace, where would we all be? Is that right? <laughs> Brothers and sisters. What have you done? What have you done that is worse than David, Abraham, Adam, who by him threw all the generations of human beings to this kind of life? What really have you done that you think God cannot forgive? I would like, what, what seriously have we done that we come to a point where we think that God will never answer us, except we blaspheme anyway, but outside that, what have you done? I ask you again. We have to come to this position of grace. I mean, if you are not still convinced, I would like to point to another biblical character, the thief at the cross. Now, this guy had done so many wickedness in his life. He had killed people. He had taken from the poor. He had even sent some souls to hell by his influence. In fact, maybe there must be somebody that wasn't ready to die. And he killed a person, and the person went to hell. But here the thief was on the cross, hanging, and he saw Jesus. Now, the natural mind is an enemy of man. Let's say we were at the cross with Jesus Christ, and the background of what we have done as this kind of criminal. We will begin to think in our mind, am I, am I crazy to ask God for forgiveness? <laughs> After all I have done? No, no, let me not just, this, before he curses me the more, let me respect myself and go to where I'm going. But no, this thief knew something. And Brabram explains what this thief knew. That same message, 130, sovereign grace is from a sovereign one. Amen. Sovereign grace from a sovereign one. Sovereign, what can he do? Sovereign can do whatsoever it wants. Listen to this now. Sovereign grace can only be given by one that's sovereign. And that God is sovereign. So he can give sovereign grace. Therefore, being sovereign grace, grace doesn't have to ask anybody. He don't have to. He does what he wants. Isn't that wonderful? He don't have to ask, can I do this? Shall I do this? Can I? Must I? Will I? Doesn't do it. It does it itself. Grace is sovereign. Therefore, he can save the vilest. He can save the worst he can save the impurest. He can save the immoralest. He can heal the sickest. Hallelujah. That thief knew scripture more than some people. 
He knew that this is a sovereign God hanging on the cross. He doesn't need to take permission from who he wronged day before yesterday, last year, who he sent to hell, who he did evil to. He doesn't need to take permission from anybody. He is a sovereign God. And if he acts, he had just one opportunity. And we have opportunity upon opportunity upon opportunity. And we take it for granted. But this thief had just one opportunity. And he took it. And when he acted it, God gave him grace. The sovereign God showed him grace. This is what I'm trying to bring. We have an opportunity tonight. Grace is available to everybody. And if we can just hold forth to that grace, if we can hold forth to that grace this evening, that divine assistance, then sanctification could not be a problem. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a problem because it is God giving to us. Now watch it. There is one thing there. Grace is available right now in this pulpit. Just like when the children of Israel like, offended God and snakes came to destroy their life, God instructed the prophet Moses. He said, raise up a brazen serpent. If you look to it, you will be saved. Now, in the human mind, how can looking at the brazen serpent save me or heal me from a mamba's bite? Just look. Look at that serpent and you will be saved. Right now, the Holy Spirit is moving, saying grace is available to each and every one of us. It doesn't matter what you have done. Grace is available to you. Reach your hands and take it off. God is, you, you, you need to see the face of God anyway. You could see him longing for us to come back, crying. It would be a disrespect to his name. That one of his elect is lost. Prophet said, God will bankrupt heaven to fulfill his promises. God wants you to come back. He, he doesn't want you to stray. It is not by power, it is not by might. Definition of grace, divine assistance given by God to men. You can't do it on your own. That is why grace is available for you. I'll read another quote. That's in the same, no, I'm sorry, 60-12-08, paragraph 164. You have it? All right, I'll read from there. Time is not my friend. Then when I walked in, there was a sign hanging there across that door, said, God bless our home. Right here in the corner was an old bedstead over here. And one over here, there led a great big fellow, not on the rock floor, great big boy, big fine looking chap standing there. I guess he was a way 170 or 80 pounds, close to six foot. And he had the blanket in his hand going, mm, mm. And she said, mama's baby. Now this is where I took my text from. He said, mama's baby. And I thought, mama's baby, and yet he had a social disease syphilis and he was dying and she, and she kissed him on the forehead and patted him like that said mama's baby why my heart just went big I thought yes no matter how deep you are in sin you are still her baby then I thought see no matter how bad off he was he's still mama's baby and I thought God said a mother may forget her suckling babe but I can never forget you for your names engraved in the palms of my hand. See, how could it be? Now, that's human for you. That man went and had syphilis disease, embarrassed the mother. It was such a disgrace to a Christian mother. But yet, look at the reaction of the mother towards his son. Mama's baby. And we are told by the prophet that God is the mama eagle. Now, no matter what we have done, is still mama's baby. He still loves us. He still, he, he's thought for us as a thought of peace and not of evil. He's a good thought towards us. God said this when the children of Israel were going to captivity in Babylon. This is when he said it. I know the thoughts I have towards you. <laughs> Don't look at about this chastisement. It is for your own good. After chastisement, come at grace. And so when we come to church, when the preacher is saying something, let's open our hearts. The chastisement will not kill us. 
The preacher will not hold this pulpit to destroy God's people. It is for grace. Grace brings chastisement. I've been in a place where I had complex. I, and I looked at people. After saying the word of the Lord, many times and many times and many times, and I myself, I say, man, whatever they do, I, I have not said anything again. They should be like that. Maybe that's how they were made. That is, that was the human part that came. But sometimes I feel this person deserves to hear this kind of thing. And then it is grace that gives me the courage to go back and meet the person. After I have been insulted, it is grace that goes back and says, look, this is the right way. That is God's grace. After we have disobeyed him, after we have done so much, we've mocked him. We've mocked his message. We've brought reproach to his message. But God's grace is still calling on to us. Amen. Come back. Come back. I am here to assist you. The strength is not your own. You have to know. Yes. That is why you have to look up to the serpent and receive strength from there. Abraham's covenant is 10210. And when I could show you in the Bible that he forgives all of our iniquity, heals all our diseases. Let me just take a hold of that promise and say, Father God, I'm weak. I need you. I know you keep your word. You are El Shaddai. I'm believing you, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Wash me in your blood. Take me back, oh Lord, and try me. Let me lean against the bustle. I am your child. I was born to you, but I got weak. But you are my strength giver. You promised you would do it. And I'm just going to hold right here, Lord. I'm going to be satisfied that you fill me with your spirit. Wash me in your blood. Take away all of my condemnation. Heal my body. What a promise it is to confirm this promise to Abraham. I'm El Shaddai. Rob Abraham, I'm a prostitute. I'm a drunkard. I'm an alcoholic. I'm all of this. I don't care what you are. Come right up to El Shaddai. If your strength and all hopes is gone, the alcoholic anonymous has given you up. The doctor has given you up. There's nothing can be done for you. It's El Shaddai, the strong one. Lean upon his bosom and just nurse and be satisfied. He will bring it to pass. Won't you love him? That's the, that's the prophet saying these things to you. He understood what grace is. And that is why one of the outstanding messages he brought was the message of grace. Now, you, you are not a born true way. When we were young, at, at the age of this, my brother, my, my uncle and them used to have a friend. They used to call him born true way. And this means that he was, <laughs> his mother gave birth to him and threw him away. That's, <laughs> that's why they called him born true way. But this is not our God. Our God doesn't form, stoop down low to the earth, form us and put his seed in us and throw us away. <laughs> God doesn't do that. He is the mama eagle. He watches over us. No matter how low we go, we are still mama's baby. I, 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 brought this, I brought this to see if I can banish the thought of a raging God from our mind. Which, if I can just do that in this little piece, I will be very, very happy. That is our God. Now, let's... Oh God. Let's immediately consider Judas and Peter. Peter had sinned against God. In our day, it's a very dangerous thing to deny God. When you do that, it's a serious crime. But Peter did it. He denied God. Judas sold God. He also sinned. Peter also sinned. But Judas, he repented. The Bible says so. The Bible said Judas repented himself. Peter also repented. But Judas seek to justify himself by the carnality of man. He thought that what sin had he, had he committed, God would never look at him on his face. So the best justified way was for him to end his life. And that was his human thinking. And today I say unto us, please, let's not justify ourselves. No matter what you have done. I mean, maybe some women might think in their mind that I've been so immoral that I wouldn't find a husband among this message body. God wouldn't be good to me to give me a clean husband. But consider Rahab. Rahab must, he might have not married a preacher, 
but he married a warrior. There is still somebody that God has for you. If only you repent. Now when God looked upon that woman, he looked upon the woman and, and saw and elected. And by scripture, the Bible says, who can lay charge against God's elect? You can't do it. God looked at her and said, no one has condemned you, neither do I. God cannot condemn even the elect. And God said, but there is a commandment. After grace comes the commandment, go and sin no more. Let us pray. Oh, be it unto me according to your word, according to your promises, I can stand secure. Oh, there is grace today. Let's, let's, let's start by saying, Lord, forgive me. I had a different thought about you. I, I thought you were a wicked God that would never consider me. I thought because of the things I have done that your grace is not sufficient. But grace stretches. It stretches. It stretches for you. I, I, I'm not talking about disgrace here. Don't get me wrong. It is an assistance by God. It's not a permission to do nonsense. It is an assistance by God to do the right thing. It stretches for you. The grace is available right now. If only you will accept it. Lord, forgive me, Lord. I had a very wrong... The people of the world thought me evil. I had a very wrong vision about you, Lord. I thought you were wicked. I thought you were a father that abandons his children. But I found by the opening of the seals, I heard my name read. That I am the royal seed of Abraham, and I know you would never lose me. Have mercy upon my foolishness. Have mercy upon my inability to recognize your nature, your truthful nature, your long-suffering nature. Oh, God, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon my people, Lord. We've had, Lord Jesus Christ, a wrong conception about you. Oh, time did not permit, Lord. Examples of examples in the Bible of when you showed your grace. We all know these things. But it's a reminder to your people, Lord, if only I can show people, oh God, the nature of our God, that we are in a relationship. We are not in a contract, no, no, Lord, we've followed, Lord, we have been a disgrace to you, but Lord, you still care. We are still mama's baby. Oh, Lord, you still love us. We did not know, Lord. Maybe we knew, but we forgot. But oh, God, we are coming back. We are coming back.